I'll take a huge 1950s scandal for 400, please. Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Boy, howdy. Have I missed you, friend? A month with no you and me and history BFF time is a month too long. But I took a very lovely break. I'm all rested and I'm ready to get into season three. And I am so happy that you are here for the first episode of season three. We are coming in hot with the weird history today. A topic that you so kindly voted on a while back on Instagram. The dark and scandalous history of TV game shows. I was actually really surprised at the landslide win for this topic, and I would never keep you waiting longer than absolutely necessary for a topic. So grab your remote control and a TV dinner, and let's get to it. Ah, the TV. That sweet, sweet escape from reality that lets us slip into a comedy sitcom or a documentary and helps us keep up with the Kardashians all at the same time. The history of the TV itself is super interesting, so we're going to dip our little tootsies in that history for a minute to see how we got from no TV to TV game shows in the first place. The idea of a TV can be traced back all the way to the 1830s and 1840s when the telegraph was invented. The idea of sending messages via wire was bananas. And then in 1867, the telegraph turned into the phonograph and we got voices traveling over the wire, not just tapping sounds. Then in 1884, Paul Nipko came up with the electric telescope, a system of sending images through wires via spinning disks. Super freaking cool, right? And essentially an early form of mechanical television. For years after that, inventors and scientists and engineers all over the world toyed with the idea of being able to send images through the wires, or even crazier, the airwaves, into people's homes. During the late 1920s, there was a race to be the first to make a working television. And the facts surrounding who the quote-unquote inventor of the TV was is super convoluted because you've got a Russian engineer, Vladimir Zvorkin, Zvorkin, Vladimir Zvorkin, I got it, I did it, (laughs) working on the TV at the same time as a 21-year-old American dude inventor guy named Philo Farnsworth. What kind of name is that? Philo Farnsworth? Anyways strange name. And at the same time that these dudes were trying to invent the TV, a Scottish engineer named John Bird was neck and neck with these guys inventing a television. But in the end, none of those people made it to the finish line. Another dude named David Sarnoff and his company presented the television to the World's Fair in New York City in 1939, but it took a hot minute for the TV to take off. In 1940, there were only a few hundred TVs in the entire country. But once people got into the dramas and the TV game shows and other programs, the rest was, as they say, history. Some very scandalous history. Okay. So I was thinking, how does one come up with the idea of a TV show when a TV is just like newly invented, let alone a TV game show? Riddle me that, Google. And Google did in fact riddle me that answer, (laughs) dear one. (laughs) So in my infinite wisdom, I forgot radio shows were a thing, which... I can't believe I did because for the past 20 Christmases of my life, my father has made my family watch the movie The Christmas Story, where the child wants a BB gun that was advertised on a weekly radio show about a cowboy. So, of course, radio shows would have been kind of the catalyst, the blueprint for TV shows. Duh. And game shows were no different. Radio game shows like 
truth or consequences, quickly saw the marketing opportunities of TV and transitioned from radio to TV game shows and began on American television in 1941. They started off innocently enough with regular people and B-list celebrities participating on all types of kooky game shows, but they just weren't making enough money or big enough ratings to stay competitive and stay on air. Big companies put big money into these game shows, and they had to do something because their financial backers were going to get real pissed real fast. The show had to do something. And because of the lack of regulation and all of this intense pressure from companies that were advertising on the shows, the producers turned to some pretty shady things to keep the people's interests. It started with game shows making their prizes more and more extravagant and extreme. Fine enough when you consider the fact that hardly anyone ever got the prizes, but sinister when you dig a little deeper and discover the fact that even when people were winning, they would often not receive the prize as it was advertised or just not receive it at all. But this was nothing compared to the scandals that would plague the 1950s game show scene. In the 1950s, What's My Line, a game show in the US and UK, exploded in popularity. The premise of the show was that a panel of celebrities would come on and guess the occupations of people. That's it. That was the whole show. I mean, we can't judge now because, I mean, some of the content that we consume on TV is questionable at best, myself included. I am a 90 Day Fiance enthusiast. Um, But don't tell anybody, please. (laughs) There were no prizes on this show, but it solidified the American and UK people's love of game shows. It wasn't until the 1950s that Shiznit hit the Fizan on, or (laughs) it hit the Jeopardy wheel, if you will. (laughs) Oh, this is a bad joke. This is a very bad joke. Anyways, moving on. 1955 was the year. The game show $64,000 Question debuted on the American television network CBS. In a single evening, this show would have 55 million viewers. Revlon, the company that sponsored the show, made a shit ton of money. And other companies were like, um, excuse me, we would also like to have an offensive amount of money come into the show. And thus, the prize money game shows were born. They went out of control. But as the number of game shows increased, so did the competition to stay relevant and popular. Companies were paying the big bucks for advertising spots on shows and sponsoring shows to begin in the first place. There was too much money and too much pressure involved for these shows to be allowed to fail. And this is when producers began fixing the games. I could go on and on about the various game show scandals of the 1950s, but I see you're almost done with your TV dinner, so I'll just, I'm just gonna tell you about the biggest one, The Game 21. It was a simple enough show where contestants rated how well they knew a category from one to 10, which became their point wager, and they would have to answer a question. If you say your question is a number one, it was easy. And if you say your knowledge of the question was a 10, it would be super banana sandwich difficult. And if you answered correctly, then you would get those points. If you didn't answer correctly, then those points would be taken away from your score. The first person to 21 was was the winner. You also get like money or whatever based on the difficulty of the question, but we don't care about that. Uh, so we're, I'm, we're not gonna talk about it because I forgot. <laughs> So when ratings started to dip, the show straight up rigged the game. They needed someone that the audience could root for, someone they could relate to to keep them coming back every week because they just weren't coming back. Viewer retention was abysmal. So the show created their perfect vision of an ordinary dude who just happened to know everything about everything. And this ordinary American man's name was Herbert Stemple. He was made out to be just freaking Johnny Appleseed, ate apple pie, 
every single night was a, the all-American dad. Why do we have so many Apple references in America? What? What is that all about? I'm going to have to Google that, but I will digress. So Herbie Herbert Stemple became the dude for the game shows, but he actually wasn't that great at acting on the show. So TV producers coached Herbie on exactly how to act during each question, how to wipe sweat from his brow at the perfect time to show stress, or when to wring his hands in frustration at a question, when to pause and look pensive, and how to celebrate answering a difficult question, all of which he knew the answers to. He was given the questions ahead of time. Everything was orchestrated. Not a single moment of the game show, the reality game show, was actually reality. But it would have been too obvious for him to have all the answers. So the questions he got right were all scripted, and the questions he got wrong were all scripted too. Everything was scripted. And Herbie Herb ended up winning, heavy air quotes, winning $70,000, which would be like winning a lot of money nowadays. Let me Google that really quick. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. It would be like winning almost ninety dollars to $100,000 in today's money, which is bananas. But the show was growing tired of this middle-aged man and thought it needed a new, fresh-faced college kid to use and up the image of the game show. They already had people in Herbert's age group hooked on the show, so they needed to reach a younger audience to keep relevant and to keep the money coming in. So they found a 21-year-old Ivy League golden boy named Charles Van Doren. They were like, Charles, Charlie, come on the show. It's going to be a great time. And Charlie was like, all right, I'm coming. It was supposed to be a whirlwind battle between the two, with the golden boy winning it all in the end and ousting the old man. But Herbert was pissed. The rigged game happened, and Herbert lost to the golden boy. But he soon went to the media and blew the whistle on the game shows, and not only did the deceit surface, but something all the more sinister popped up. The public was absolutely shocked. Not only had it come out that 21 was rigged, but almost every TV game show on air was rigged in the 50s. The public was pissed because the TV game shows went through hoops. They jumped through hoops of fire to make it seem like the game shows were not rigged at all. They had some TV shows that had the contestants go into these secret little pods and they would like float the pods in the air to show, oh, there's no strings attached to these soundproof pods. Nobody can hear anything from the outside. It was absolute madness. So to find out that nearly all of the game shows were rigged was a total blow to the trust the public had in these TV game shows. The media coverage of this scandal was huge, with outlets like Time Magazine covering the whole thing, with Herbert as the whistleblower. He was on the cover of Time Magazine. I'll show, I'll put a picture up on Instagram. It's bananas. The public lost all of its faith and interest in game shows at this point. They all but disappeared in 1955, but the public is forgetful, and in 1961, game shows came back with a vengeance, but only to lead to more scandal of a much more serious kind. You see, the thing that Herbie also uncovered at the time were the very inappropriate things that were going on behind the scenes at game shows. There was something about game show hosts that turned them into absolute dickheads. Through the 1960s to the 1990s, sex scandals, harassments, lawsuit, abuse, both work-related and sexually related, cheating, and more plagued the game show scene, with most of it being swept under the rug. But at that point, Jeopardy, The Wheel of Fortune, The Price Was Right, and many other shows were too big to fail. 
Even nowadays, you can read about all sorts of things that go on in the game show world, from mild cheating and inappropriate comments made by hosts to full-on sex scandals and illegal money stuff. But game shows have a chokehold on people across the world, with new dating game shows, survival game shows, and all sorts of other shenanigans popping up each year. And it doesn't look like game shows are going away anytime soon. We have come to our final thought today, my friend. I really wanted to tell you about this, but it just didn't fit in anywhere. And you know, that's why we have the final thought in the first place. So, amid the scandalous 1950 game show era, something bananas happened. On September 13th, 1978, the show The Dating Game was filming an episode. So fun, right? Love a good dating game show. But the thing that made this episode different from all the others was that a serial killer was a contestant on the show. I know, I know, I know. Rodney Alcala, a.k.a. The Dating Game Killer, which is a terrible name because he didn't kill anybody that he met on a dating game. He was just on a dating game. I mean, like, could we not get a little bit more creative with the serial killer name? But I'm just splitting hairs at this point, so ignore me. Anyways, so Rodney, a.k.a. Dating Game Killer, was not only a contestant on this dating game show, he won. He won the show. Chills. Literal chills. Okay, so two things. Number one, dude bro was actively a suspect for like three to four murders, and the police were like, yeah, this guy, we think he did it. We want this dude, but he got away, and we don't know where he is. Number two, the dude Rodney used his real name, the one that the police knew, the one that they were looking for, he used his real name on the game show. Oh my God. (laughs) He was like, he must have been in a system or something, right? Maybe not. I don't know. So my question is, how did dude bro get on the show? I thought they would do some sort of background check because... They're putting these men and sometimes women on the stage to date an eligible bachelor or bachelorette. Wouldn't you think, would you not think that they would do some sort of vetting? But no, apparently not. They did no vetting. So many questions. How did he get on the show? How did he win? But fear not, dear one. Thankfully for the Bachelorette contestant, Cheryl Bradshaw, when she went backstage to chat with the winner, he was hella creepy. And she got the ick from him and refused to go on a date and or to even give him any of her information. She peaced the fuck out from backstage and was like, I cannot, I cannot do this. And the producers were like, all right, no problem. See you later. We won't give him any of your contact information. Thank God they didn't because then after that, he went to kill like two more people. How bananas is that? How bananas is that, my delightful little donut? And that is all she wrote. And by she, I mean me. That's all I wrote about this episode. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today, friend. I have got... So many fun things in store for us this season. The first being that I launched new merch. There is indeed new merch available for season three. I am so excited about it. There's some really cute t-shirts, really cute sweaters. There's a tote bag. There's phone cases. I'm working on some enamel pins. Those are not ready yet, but they are in the works. They're wonderful. I love them. I got a bunch of stuff for myself that I will show on Instagram. So excited about it. I hope you like it too. There is a link in the bio for that. And just a little FYI, if you are a Patreon, member you get a 15% discount what crazy (laughs) just FYI Mm, it's pretty cool to be a patron (laughs) and a cool thing number two happening this season is I started a voicemail for for the love of history 
Yes, you can send me a voicemail with your questions or comments or just your random thoughts while you're driving or anything, whatever pops into your cute little noggin. It's totally anonymous. Anom- <laughs> it's totally anonymous if you'd like it to be. You don't have to say your name if you don't want to. No email necessary, nothing. You can record a voicemail on any device with a mic and it'll get sent directly to me. Yay! I am so excited to hear from you. Last thing I want to tell you uh, slash ask you is my goal for the season is to reach 100 ratings and reviews by the end of the season. Right now we have 71 across three podcast platforms. So if you haven't left a rating or review yet and you feel so inclined, I would really, really appreciate it if you left one. And if you've already written a review or given a rating Why not send this episode or any other episode to your friends or family because that is the number one way people find podcasts and it really, really helps in the internet algorithm to show for the love of history to more potential history BFFs if people rate the podcast. So yeah, that would be really lovely if you could do that. Help me achieve this goal for this season. So, okay, I think I've talked enough. (laughs) So take good care of yourself, drink your water, Get some good sunshine on your skin, friend. That summer weather is coming and it does wonders for your mood. I will see you next week on Friday, May 13th. Oh, snap, Friday the 13th. To talk about Russian sexpionage. Okay, bye. Why is there a metronome right now? Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay.